welcome. My name is Alonda Carter and I am the Recovering Hunbot and this is season two of Hey Hun, You Woke Up. This podcast is brought to you on 10 podcast platforms, including Stitcher, iTunes, Spotify, Google, and Anchor. The video version is on YouTube. Today, I am chatting with my friend and colleague, Robert Fitzpatrick. Robert is the co-founder and president of the U.S.-based nonprofit consumer education and advocacy group, Pyramid Scheme Alert. He has served as an expert witness and consultant in more than 30 court cases against pyramid schemes or MLMs. In 2020, he wrote and published the book Ponzi-nomics, the untold story of multi-level marketing, the first comprehensive book on the multi-level marketing phenomena, detailing its origins and history, recruiting and cult persuasion methods, and political influence and buying activities. Phil will be a link to his book in the description. As a heads up, my internet connection was a bit wonky, so the video may be a bit pixelated here and there. My apologies in advance. And now let's welcome Robert to the show. Robert, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate your time. And we are going to be discussing the possibility because, you know, I don't have any actual proof, but after you start digging into multi-level marketing companies, one can't help but wonder, huh, how did these people get to the top? And then there's these different lawsuits that are going on and things you start hearing. And it's, it starts really looking like people are not getting there by their work ethic and their hard work alone. It's as if they are placed there somehow, whether it is by the company or somebody else at the top. And I know you have been involved in fighting this corruption for a very long time. So I wanted to get your insight and expertise on these potential backroom deals that go on within this industry. So, you know, give me some of your thoughts about it. Just, you know, do you think this is going on? How do you think it's going on? Why do you think it's going on? And we'll just take it from there. So, Alonda, what you're talking about is something not spoken about very much. Um, and I think it's, it's, uh, it's not spoken of very much because it's the, the second or third level of deception that is occurring when somebody is in, involved in multi-level marketing. You, if you peel it back, you could keep going even lower and, and lower in, in the levels of deception. But if you don't penetrate the first level, you'll never get to those others. And the, the lower levels of deception and of the type I'm speaking about, placing people in positions that they did not earn through the, the official compensation plan, that is, having a certain volume of personal sales, a certain configuration of recruits who have a certain volume of sales and so on that entitle you to a certain percentage of override payment from all of those other people plus your own, plus any other bonuses that might've been you know, uh, uh, get given to that rank and so on encountering people who are at these ranks, but you're pretty sure from your own experience in the business and in the company, they didn't do that. They didn't earn it. How'd they get there? And you have suspicions that they, what, how could they have gotten there if they didn't do it? Well, they had to have been literally given those positions in complete violation uh, of uh, the, the plan and in complete uh, disregard of all the other people that are out there trying to reach these levels according to the plan. Other examples of such things are uh, blatant misrepresentations of products that somehow everybody's saying, but the company will deny that, well, we didn't, we didn't say that, it must be rogue distributors out there saying it, but how did they learn it? Um, and, and there could be many, many others. Um, selling into areas of other countries that they are not authorized to. This was done when China was first being introduced. All these people had strangely Taiwan or Hong Kong addresses. And yet there they were in China operating and so on. So um, these are 
levels of harm, deception, scam, dishonesty inside the MLM system, multi-level marketing system that isn't talked about very much, but is experience. From my work through Pyramid Scheme Alert, I've had many people tell me of this, and I've had a few people explain it to me, how it works. I'll give you an example of how some of this deception inside. When new MLMs are launched, um, they often claim that this thing just burst out of nowhere, that you know, a CEO, uh, 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 somebody that had been in another MLM or another industry saw this opportunity, found this product, launched it, it just took off like a rocket. How wonderful, there's the evidence, this thing is really unique. As it turns out, what they had been doing, this thing was built up by bringing together a team of people who had existing downlines, giving them enormous bonuses for defecting from the other MLM and coming over to them, bringing as many of their downline as they can, and then promising them key positions. And then when it is launched, these people suddenly are claiming that they have enormous downlines, auto, uh, new, new downlines which are nothing but existing downlines that have been uh, pirated, actually. And uh, then they claim there's momentum building. In fact, this, this was all fabricated. It, it was all stolen from other MLMs. It, it was a heist. The product was stolen from some other company or purchased. It has nothing unique about it. There's nothing different. It's just a ripoff and a, re, a continuation. But to the person on the outside, this story can be very convincing. It sounds like a startup, when in reality it was a was a a, a kind of spinoff. Is what it was. Very first, one of the very first MLMs it was created exactly that way. Amway. Amway is, if you read the lore, was started in the basement by two men, DeVos and Van Andel, who got this product of laundry and then launched this company and they would hit the pavement, that's another extent, door to door, selling and hawking their laundry soap. In fact, these two guys had been 10 years involved with the first MLM, Neutralite. They were trained and Neutralite was being by the Food and Drug Administration for all kinds of product deception, false claims, false medical claims, dangerous medical claims. What they and they were in danger of being shut down. So these two guys, Boston and Andel, thousand of the downline to come over and they started a new company. They copied everything except the product because they already knew you don't really sell the product product is just comes along. What you sell is the opportunity. They use the exact same language, same pay plan, everything. But the lore is that these two guys were a startup. Now, going back to what we're experiencing, where people are getting given favorable positions, uh, unique opportunities, unfair chance, and so on above all other people, insider dealing. Is that occurring? Well, we know anecdotally it occurs constantly. We know that. But let's just go a little deeper and ask um, why and how exactly does it occur? Well, first of all, we know that inside MLM is completely secret. There, there's no transparency. Everything is on a need to know basis, right? If you're at this level, you don't know what's going on at that level. They know what's going on at your level. All the, all the information flows down. So information flows down, but knowledge never goes up. You don't know what's going on above you. And many people have discovered this, that the secret is that there's no secret. <laughs> the, the secret to make money in MLM is that there is no secret. <laughs> It's really about who you know and when you began 
and where did you come from and that sort of thing. The question often comes up to me as uh, you're saying, people will say to me, you're saying you really can't make money at this. And I'm saying, well, I'm not saying you can't, I'm saying you don't, because I'm just looking at data. The data over a long historic period shows that if you add up all the people who've been in a particular MLM from its inception to today, and said, what percent of all those people, the ones who came and went, and the ones that are in now, the ones that used to be in, what percent of them ever made a profit? It will turn out to be far less than a percent. It's a percent of a percent, you know. It, it, statistically, it's an effective zero. So if you're now going to join, and you're the 100,001 or the million plus one person to join, it would be accurate, truthful to say to that person, you won't make money. You can't make money. So then the people come to me and say, but somebody is making money. How did they make money? Well, that's kind of the mystery uh, because it is so secretive. How do people make money? Well, we know some people are extremely uh, un, you know, uh, scrupulous and they will say anything to anybody and they will sort of deceive enough people to get started. Some people are in affinity groups. Uh, I just talked with someone today who, who said their sister had been in a, had been initially very successful in, in a particular MLM, cosmetic MLM. Why, how? Well, she's in a very close knit religious community and she basically got everybody in her community. So suddenly she had this tremendous volume at least initially. Of course, it dissipated very fast. But she basically exploited that community. Some people start up in a new territory, a whole new area, and, and they make money. Some people were in on it at the beginning, as I was describing. They came from another MLM. They got the bonuses. They were giving extremely advantageous positions at the beginning. Um, some people, and for example, in Amway, it was discovered, and this was written about in the books, people that others thought were making money from Amway system, the compensation plan, as it's laid out. It turns out that they were diamond level and so on, and so they assumed they had all of this downline and volume and so on. But what they discovered is um, yeah, they could be diamond, but even at diamond level, you could be making minimal income, minimal. N not an, and the costs to maintain the diamond level were extremely high. You're having to battle this enormous attrition. So uh, people quitting, the cost, you couldn't just replenish them by getting the phone, you could get on the road and put on events and and, and travel, and when you had somebody who would hold a house meeting, you had to go to that house meeting and yourself and so on. What they really found out was that these people's true wealth came from these event, you know, extravaganzas, selling registration fees, selling books, selling videos. Um, and that's where their money coming from, which was external, wasn't even part of the compensation plan. So the compensation plan was being given credit for these people, uh, who, people's apparent lavish lifestyles that was actually funded externally by something altogether different. So I, th I think uh, this is of a genre, the given favorable positions, insider dealing, family members, somebody who will bring over a big downline from another company to be able to jump to the top suddenly is common in the industry, so-called industry. It's very common. And if you think about it, why wouldn't it happen? There's no accountability for this, right? It's all done in secret. 
the organization is absolutely authoritarian, you can't question it. Who would you appeal to? If And the remedies of their, their, their ability to shut you down, silence you, is total. I mean, they can just cut you out. They can fire you, in effect. And I've talked with many people who lost everything because they complained. You know, they blew the whistle on stuff like this. How did this person get in that position? I know for a fact they didn't uh, organize, they didn't recruit, they just suddenly show up. Well, for that, they suddenly became enemies of the organization. They were demoralizing people. They were lying. They were, they were accused of immorality. All kinds of horrible things were leveled at them. And they're out. Once you're out, you're out. That's the end of the story. Business goes on. So the, the structure of MLM, non-accountable, secret, authoritarian, um, it's, an, it's the perfect environment for cheating. <laughs> cheating. So why wouldn't it occur? I mean, of course it occurs. And it, it even occurs in, in real businesses. Of course it occurs in real businesses. Um, but in, in real businesses, they can say out front, well, I'm the owner, I get to do this, right? If you don't like it, too bad. But MLM is supposed to be a system for everybody to rise up. It is supposed to be a, a, a rule, of a, a kind of democratized method, you know, and, and which is constantly bringing people in and promising them an opportunity based on rules, based on a compensation plan and so on. That's very different. For them, it would be more like embezzling or uh, it would be like uh, nepotism. You know, it would be like that. So the environment is perfect. Um, I, I would like to talk about it though in a little deeper level about why people have a hard time accepting that that's going on. Now, even though they see it, why do people not grasp that of course it's happening? Of course they're gaming the system. Of course it's to my disadvantage. I'm nobody. Of course they're lying about it. Why don't people see that? You know, why is it hard to to hold that position, that view, even if you see it with your own eyes. And I think I concluded a long time ago that MLM, multi-level marketing, all of them are engaging in out, outrageously decept, deceptive activities. We, this was all so well documented, promising income when effectively nobody makes an income, selling a product that is but ridiculously overpriced, selling the product with absurd claims of e efficacy, you know, um, claiming that people can sell the product at all on a detailed basis, as if you could go out on the street or from your home and just find customers and sell it to them <laughs> against Costco, against Walmart, against online, you know, and with their own eyes, people know that isn't true. They, they know that no one really can read. They eventually discover that nobody is making any money. So they discover it's not direct selling, not an income opportunity. And yet, there it is, claiming these, these things all the time, surrounding themselves with politicians, celebrities, clergy, who endorse it, they dress the part, they look sincere. One reason it's hard to grasp that they're lying, outrageously lying, is that the kind of lie they're telling, they're saying, is a story most of us want to believe. It's the story of business. It's the story of capitalism, of entrepreneurship, of opportunity, of making good 
of succeeding, of, of developing yourself personally, right? That's what they're claiming this is, this is all about. These are stories, it's, these are not wild, crazy stories. This is things we're all familiar with. We believe in these things automatically. And MLM claims to be those things. So it's very hard for people to grasp a lie so big that is using religion, patriotism, capitalism, um, and personal testimonials, and so on, dishonestly. Very few people could grasp that anyone would dare do that. Who would do that? How could, and if they were doing it, how did they get away with it? So it is, uh, it is the classic definition of a big lie, a lie so outrageous that the average person really cannot believe anyone would dare um, say these things if they weren't true. So even people that have lost money and, and been treated horribly as lost friends out of it, uh, found out the product was, you know, not what it was, maybe even made people sick product. Even after that, some of them will tell me, but I still think the owners of the company were honest people. Because <laughs> they can't believe that anybody, you know, they just, it, it, it's impossible to, to grasp that, that those smiling, beautifully tailored suits they were wearing, the nice Rolex watch, the, the clergy, the church they went to, the, the politician that came and talked, that that person could be perpetrating or participating in such a, a fraudulent presentation, a dishonest presentation, where the truth is the opposite of what they're saying. So I wanted to interject one other thing about that, that I think also perpetuates that is that all of these organizations tend to have some sort of charity and having that charity because we want to give to charities, we want to help other people that tends to hide the truth and legitimize it in people's eyes because, well, they have to be good people. They're doing something good for the world. Look at the charity that they have. Look at this foundation they started. Look at what they're doing. I think it was with Market America um, just did something. Dave Vaughn had sent this, something to me. And I want to say it was the Boys and Girls Club. And then they also gave them all Market America products, of course, because you want to indoctrinate the next generation, you know, early, get them while they're young and believing that these products are fabulous. But I think that's also... Um, another thing that adds to that layering of that deception that's going on. Would you agree with that? Absolutely, the, you know, but this is often true, uh, you know, of dishonest organizations that they will, well, look, here's the perfect example of that. Uh, Purdue Pharma, the big pharmaceutical company that was found guilty of, of these enormous uh, deceptive marketing plans to the medical establishment of uh, opioids, uh, hydrocodone, and so on. Uh, they were selling these to the doctors. They were telling the doctors it was not addictive. They were telling the doctors that it was, if people did get addicted, they had abused it. It was their fault. They were giving all kinds of bribes, speaking fees, and so on to doctors. And the death toll was astronomical in America from opioid uh, mm -hmm. overuse. That company and those, the owners, the true owners of that company, the, the Sackler family, were the are, were at that time the world's largest art patrons, right? They known worldwide for their largesse, for their benevolence, for their contribution to the art community, and they were famous as as philanthropists. Uh, Bernie Madoff was a famous philanthropist. So that is a common diversionary tactic of people who are engaged in dishonest activities that they will create this uh, other activity that looks so good that it somehow 
a person might say, well, even if the business is bad, look at all the good they're doing. As if that would balance it out somehow. As if stealing, but then giving the money to charity or some of it, pittance of it, even a pittance of it, somehow exonerates the person that had engaged in the theft. So yeah, that's uh, MLMs are famous for this philanthropy, foundations, helping people and, and so on. Uh, that's part, part of the diversion too. And, um, but going to the heart of it is what I, I keep doing. I, and I, I guess I have this view that if people could, more people could grasp that the fundamental uh, fraudulence of the endless chain scheme that multi-level marketing is based upon. The very idea that you could promise money to someone based on their recruiting other people who recruit other people and so on to infinity, and then call that a viable plan. That that plan could work for everybody and that it would result in people earning money, that it could be done, that sales could be carried out this way where you have infinite number of salespeople in any given area, unlimited, that that all could work. If people could grasp that that itself is all wrong, that's all a lie. That is the lie. The big lie is that this is a business, but an endless chain is not a business. It's a pyramid scheme, it's a chain letter, it is a classic trick, and it will always, by its design, result in the vast majority, depending how it's structured, uh, losing. They have to lose. They lose, the money flows to the top. They quit, they're replaced, and it keeps going. So it does keep saturating eventually they have to move to new territories and so on but it can go on for a long long time losing 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 people coming going and the one at the top lying to every one of them every new recruit that comes in tells them it's the greatest opportunity in the world if you ask well how many how many have ever been in this thing and how many of them ever made any money could you give me that i want to do some due diligence they always say, oh, we don't have that data. Right into their faces. We don't have that data. They do have exactly that data. Well, um, how long do you think it would take for me to make money? Oh, if you work hard, it's all about hard work. Well, hard work at what? Uh, what do I have to tell people? Um, because if most people lose, how would I ever recruit anybody? Yeah, what am I going to tell them? I want you to join this opportunity. Most people lose. <laughs> and in fact, me up. <laughs> yeah. In fact, if you lose, I'll still get your money, you know, so I'll just replace you with somebody else. Nobody would join that. So, so, you know, what is it you have to do that is called hard work? What is that? Well, if it's lying, which it is, if lying is the core business, then why would you think that everybody at the top following the rules? Why wouldn't they engage in nepotism, favoritism, putting people and pushing people out who they just don't like, kicking them out unfairly? Why wouldn't they do that? The whole, whole thing is founded on lying, but lying that they're getting away with. Lying that is more profitable than telling the truth. Lying that is far more profitable than a real business of hard actual work where you deliver a service or a product where there's transparency, where people know what they're getting into when they do a transaction with you. Um, then it's a lie that is allowed. It's a profitable lie. Of course, this you know, um, is also what the definition is of organized crime. It's the same thing. It's the same idea. And MLM has been compared to organized crime. The thing different though, is that organized crime is called organized crime. 
In other words, it's identified as illegal activity. It may be getting away with it. It may get away with it because it has bribed and corrupted politicians. Uh, it may get away with it because it engages in violence. So it intimidates whistleblowers. So the code of silence keeps it safe along with corrupting politicians and corrupting police. We know that. It's called organized crime. But if you look at the fundamentals, you've kind of got the same thing going on here. It's not called that, it's called business. It's called business. So it makes it very hard for people to grasp. But I think if they grasp the fundamentals of what MLM is, and that's what my book was all about, is that I felt like I had to finally say what the whole thing is. Where did it come from? How did it get invented? How did something like an endless chain scheme, which had been historically understood to be fraud, chain letters, Ponzi schemes, those are all versions of the endless chain. How could you have an endless sales chain, so-called sales, using a product? How could that be different? It's fundamentally the same. How did that become legalized? And, and, uh, and how, did it, how did they manage to convince so many people, even though the math is, I mean, I've been on how many TV shows or radio interviews or whatever, where they ask me that same question, uh, how does it work? What's the math, you know? And, and I go, well, you know, you get one person recruits five, five recruit, five each, 25 more, 25, each recruit five more, 125, one, two, three. You can only go about 10 more levels. You pass the population of the earth, right? Can't work, can't work. So how did they manage to get a system based on what can't work to be treated as honest work? <laughs> like it really does work. Well, this was the result of being allowed, being allowed, and that was done through political bribery, lobbying, and then through extreme propaganda, you know, identifying it with entrepreneurship, sales, using the term direct selling, Counting uh, these testimonials with images of wealth and success, talking the language of self-improvement, speaking about a kind of making a kind of metaphysical claim that if you your success depends on how you are up in your mind, are you confident? Can you envision success? Um, are you determined to get success? If one of those things, some of those things are missing, then you'll fail. Not because it's an endless chain, which guarantees you'll fail. Not because, because you would be lying to people and they would find out that it's a lie and they would quit on you. No, it's all supposed to be somehow a mental process. These are propaganda techniques. So politics and propaganda, are the tools of the big lie. And I think if people grasp that, that MLM, and I don't care which name of company it is, they're all the same. They all use the same compensation system, which is the endless chain. They all make the same promises. And people move from one to the other, these top uh, characters that move from one to the other, uh, start up a new one, it fails, create a new one, become suddenly the sales director of another one. They move around in their, in their circle because <clears throat> it, they're all the same. They're all identical. The process is the same. And I think you said something very important is they move around in their circle because they all know each other. It's not like they're strangers. They bring each other over to the new opportunity. Right. Like, hey, I found this. And, you know, that other person is like, I, I have an instance right now of something I'm working on where somebody's um, income dropped from, I want to say it was $120,000 a month to $60,000 a month. Still very good, but, you know, still defrauding people. Moved over to this other one. 
boom, shot up. Well, that's real easy to figure out as to why, since you brought over people with you and were put in a plum position. And now you're going around talking about this. You were shilling coffee, but now you're shilling this other thing. You're not an expert in it. You're not an expert in finances, but you're making people believe that you are. And you're making them think that starting with your mindset, because they all start with that. Um, but I also wanted to tell you that I recently interviewed someone who had been at the top um, of two different MLMs and she was struggling because her teammates, they were doing all the things. She knew people who were doing all the things. I think one of them was related to her. And th there's this one coach called Fraser Brooks. I don't know if you know him or not. He's from uh, the UK, I believe. And she went on some trip where she was with him and she pulled him aside and she's like, okay, well, what's going on? Because they're doing X, Y, and Z and they're not having results. His go-to was, well, most people tell you that they are doing the work and they're just not really doing the work. And she's like, no, I know that this person is doing the work, but they're not having any results. And he had, I mean, he had nothing because what is there to have other than, well, it's all a great big lie. Exactly. That, that's what I mean. The thing is so fundamentally alive, they can't answer these things because in real business, you, there, there would be a whole set of questions you might ask. What's the market? How many salespeople? What are our competitors? Is our pricing positioned correctly? Um, are we addressing the correct market of people? Is there a real need for our product? Is there problems with the product? and so on. <laughs> These are real questions. And if somebody is not succeeding, then there's work to do. Now the work could be that the person's not putting in the time, okay. But there's so much more to, to talk about. But in MLM, it's, there's, there's nothing really to talk about. There's nothing really to talk about. And uh, there's only one thing is you keep repeating. Uh, on, on the, I, on the subject of kind of these these sort of bizarre contradictions like this, one of them that always sort of amazed me is you get into MLM, you go to your upline, not doing well. My friends are, uh, are, are mad at me and I couldn't even get my own sister into it. What am I, you know, what am I doing? I'm thinking I'm gonna have to give up. And they always tell you, don't quit. Don't quit. That's the one thing, stick to it. It takes time. You're building a business. Don't quit. Be loyal. The company is going to support you. But then when you see the, the, uh, the um, resumes of these MLM leaders, 20 years in the MLM business in various companies, <laughs> the top people have been in 10 or 12 or 13 different MLMs hopping from one to the other telling each person never quit. They're constantly quitting to move and jump from one to the other. I had, um, a, I have a colleague, I won't name him because I don't know if he wants to really publicize this, but he has spoken publicly about it, who was the first person to actually come and tell me how he, how he was involved. And basically he was, and there are many others like this, his, his business was to bring downlines. That, that's basically what he did. He brought them and got bonuses. So, and he said there were there's startups occurring all the time in MLM. And there's a phone uh, ring with this where they're constantly, you know, uh, soliciting these, uh, not, they don't have to be at the very top, but they're considered heavy hitters. They've got a downline or they know people that have a downline. So they're connectors and uh, they're deal makers, um, fixers. And that's what he would do. He would get these calls and so, so company, so-and-so is moving on, defecting, bringing over, got a product. They got, of course, everything's uh, in the box. There's a, there's a, the lawyers for the, that set these things up. There's software for the pay plan. And then they bring in a few others that put a, a kind of some kind of a special spin to it, a little 
phony story of the history and uh, enlightenment where they had this moment of epiphany uh, they've always wanted to do this this dream the dream story it's, it's all crap i mean this is all packaged marketing stuff and now but they need troops they need troops we just say they need victims cannon fodder they need the people now to come in and start pouring their money and their hope into this concocted crap that they've made up this company and so-called company identical to all the others but said to be unique and that was his work so he would get on the phone he had some downliners from wherever he was at the, time, at the moment. He knew other people like this. He would organize a body of them. They would come over on conditions, guaranteed certain position level at the pay plan and, and, and accessing the bonuses. If you look at an MLM pay plan, you get a little percent. You move up with volume. You get a higher percent on everything below you. You move up a little further, you get a higher percent. So you're getting more of, this, of the sale, the higher you go. The further away you get from the sale, the more you get. Then at a certain level, they have all these bonuses, which are what? Nothing more than, again, pulling more money out from the bottom and giving it to the top. So that everyone I examined, looking at their, their disclosure, their so-called disclosure, it always came out over half of all the money, all the reward money paid out by the company to everybody, over half of it went to the top 1%. How could that possibly be? Did they sell more than the other half? of? No, they sold almost nothing, but they're positioned and the pay plan does the opposite of what a sales company does. Sales company rewards where the sale is, and then little tiny override may go a couple of levels up to their managers for their work in making those sales happen. MLM does the opposite. The person doing the transaction gets a very little bit. The majority of the money goes straight up to the top of the scheme. So these people that are brought in um, are said, I want to be up there where the higher commissions are. Ultimately, new MLMs keep getting created uh, because there's a real simple truth and about MLM that if you, the only way to get to the top is to start at the top. And that's what a lot of people realize. They can get to a certain level, like my colleague who was bargaining and he would bring people over and he would get a position. These things often dissipate fast so they move on to the next one. And so now um, I just read uh, the magazine, Social Selling News, I think. Mm -hmm. They said their, their publication goes to 800 MLM companies. That's what they have on their website. 800 MLM companies, 800? And that's just the ones that they get. So I've read this, that there could be 1,200, 1,400 MLM companies. How many could, could there possibly be? If, if it has, everybody is exponentially recruiting, how could there be? So this is like a, a frenzy of, of lying uh, and, and, and that is propagating on this mass scale on a level almost unimaginable, selling this fake story about direct selling income, all based on what the chain letter, um, protected sadly with political lobbying so that it assumes legitimacy, making it very difficult for a person to on their own conclude this is a scam. Well, well, you know more than the FTC, <laughs> right? Why didn't your state attorney general do something? They're operating right here in this state. Why wouldn't a member of the state legislature have spoken up? I mean, 
thousands of people have been in this. Uh, you know more than all of them. So it makes it very hard for a person by themselves to reach an accurate conclusion based on what they've seen, experienced. So, you know, that I think it, the big lie protects all the smaller lies. Let's call putting people in favorable positions, jumping uh, the chain to the top, getting payments that are not even part of the pay plan, uh, travel allowances, all kinds of things that would be uh, normally thought of as illegal in a real business, a especially a publicly traded business, um, with where there's no accountability, total secrecy, and complete un uh, authority to do whatever they want, and the ability to silence and fire and eliminate any question, right? That, you know, it makes it very hard for people to grasp that these things are going on because they still haven't grasped that the entire model is a big lie, it's a big, a big fake. It's not a business, it's not an income opportunity, it's not direct selling, it's a chain letter, it's a pyramid scheme. That's really what MLM is. Legal, okay, maybe it is legal because something can be, can be legal and not lawful, right? Something can be legal only because it's not prosecuted. There's a presumption of legality. So whether it's legal or not is not the issue, it's what is it? How does it work? And um, a chain letter has a certain mathematical <laughs> design to it. A uh, pyramid scheme is based upon Lose transferring their money to the so winners, um, and if you put that into the format of a business, then you know, and it's allowed, then it makes it very hard for a person to penetrate that and see this whole thing to be exactly what it really is. And it took me over three hundred pages to, <laughs> to explain that in my book, because I had to say, "Where did it begin? How, how could it have developed like this?" And what, was there ever a chance that it might have been shut down? Yes, there was. Politically, that chance got lost, though. And, um, and, and then why didn't it saturate? Well, they went global. You know, 80% uh, of, of MLM is now outside the US. I have another question for you. And since the business opportunity rule is being reexamined this year, and, you know, hopefully, MLM can be included since it's been excluded from that. I wanted to ask you about that, what your thoughts are on that, about how, you know, if MLM were to be included, what would be the outcome of that? How could we help to get it to be included? And then also for you to plug your book. Yeah. Well, uh, as you said, the business opportunity rule for people that don't know. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission can enact rules. These are um, policies that they force because the FTC is a law enforcement agency. So it can, and, it, and this has to be done through a process and the process can take a long time. And they adopted a franchise rule. Um, and the franchise rule was adopted in the 70s, I think and was largely responsible for cleaning up franchising. When franchising first originated, it was full of fake franchises. You know, people would sell 10 franchises in the same little town, you know, which could only support one. And, and they would uh, make outrageous upfront charges and so on. And they would tell people that there are 100 other franchises around the country, they're all making money when none of them were making money. So the franchise rule was adopted and the rule required franchisors, the ones selling franchises, to disclose quite a lot of information. Who else bought the franchise? Give me some examples. Average revenues and so on. I mean, there was a transparency imposed by the FTC on the franchising business, resulting in franchising being, uh, you know, a legitimate 
form of, of, of business that didn't take out all the risk and so on. But at least it's not an organized fraud. But the franchise rule had a threshold uh, where I think it was around $500. If you charge less than $500, the rule didn't apply at all. Well, this strangely, right at about the same time that MLM was developing. So MLMs saw the rule, knew they were selling something like a franchise, they're selling distributorships, um, but they were careful not to call them franchise, although a couple of MLMs have called themselves franchise or unfranchised or something like that. You know, they, they've hinted that they're kind of like a franchise. Uh, <clears throat> All of them would charge under $500. $499 was kind of a typical uh, top level number. Of course, after you paid $499, which was under the $500, you could pay thousands and thousands more very soon. But nevertheless, under the rules, the franchise rule, MLM was not covered. So um, I think in the, in the 90s, mid 90s or so, the FTC began considering an, uh, a, what they business opportunity rule because MLMs are not franchises. What are they? Well, they're, they're called business opportunity. Alanda, I've got this great business opportunity I want to talk to you about. Oh, is, what is it? A franchise of some kind? No, no, not a franchise. Better. This is multi-level marketing, right? Um, so this rule would cover what was not covered under the franchise rule. That was the background on it. And this thing was rolled out and um, around 2006, I believe 2004, public comment. And the MLM industry for which this thing was designed to cover and the initial uh, information that the FTC released made that very clear that this was to cover what had been left out under the business, under the franchise law, the um, MLM industry organized these cook, cookie cutter letters, form letters, 18,000 of them, they got into the FTC. The FTC knew that most of them were form letters, orchestrated, and they knew that. But this was, uh, from 2006 to 2012, I think it was 2012. So this was under the George W. Bush administration and then extended into the Obama administration. And during this time, the FTC was not the MLMs. And so um, as a result of this so-called letter writing, this is what the FTC claimed. First, they said, these are orchestrated form letters. We know that but we're gonna cite them and say, we've decided to take MLM out. So MLM got exempted. The very reason the business opportunity rule was created became validated. What does it cover now? They talked about envelope stuffing schemes, vending machine schemes. I mean, th this is nothing. The purpose of it was halted, thwarted, stopped, and it was exempted. Now, that was then, 2012, when that happened. 2012 to today, now we're talking nine more years. And during this time, people like you have developed a voice. And the, the what was, uh, at the time that the exemption occurred, People wrote and said that this is a scam, that you're going to exempt the thing. And it's huge. It's pervasive. Millions of people are losing their money, being lied to. At least put in disclosure rules so that a person could find out some truthful, could do due diligence. The FTC didn't do that. And they claimed that the, the rule would never have revealed fraud anyway, which of course the rule was never intended to reveal fraud. It was only to equip an individual person with the tools to get enough information to make a, a valid decision. 
as it is when you join an MLM, you're doing it on faith. Your sister-in-law said it's a good deal. You ask for average incomes. How many people join and quit? What are the comp how many people are in the scheme in this little town we're in right now? You don't get any any of that. You don't get it. So now we hear that the FTC is planning to revisit. And I think it's the result of your site, other sites, video channels, uh, the series on Showtime, on Becoming a God in Central Florida, the John Oliver Show, the Herbalife fiasco, and all the information that came out, the short selling on Wall Street, the information about Herbalife, um, the realization that people are not making money, the number 99% loss rate is in the media all the time now. Uh, our conference that was held, where even an FTC commissioner came and spoke, several other FTC officials were there as presenters. So the, 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 there's, there's a sea change occurring, something's occurring uh, that may may possibly result in some oversight, at least something that would at least allow an individual person to demand and be able to demand basic information, maybe. I'm skeptical and I'm qualifying all this because of the history, Alanda. I think people should be aware of that. The FTC has a corrupt history truly corrupt history, revolving door, take a job at the FTC, go to work for MLM, leave MLM, come back to the FTC, or intermediaries, consulting law firms that are connected, or work for the DSA itself, direct selling associate, which is the lobby. So you could become a lobbyist you know, from MLM, become a lobbyist for MLM, somehow get a job within MLM, be a consultant for MLM, then get a job inside the FTC. And this is historically what has been happening. And so, and we saw this with the Herbalife incident in which the former chairman of the FTC, upon leaving the FTC, went to work for Herbalife and helped Herbalife negotiate a favorable settlement when the FTC finally did prosecute them. So um, on the side of nothing happening good out of it, there's a lot of weight of political power, lobbying, contributions, so-called. I would just call them in the book, I call them bribery. They used to be called bribery and in, in my book, in Ponzinomics, I, I, I said to readers, to grasp this, you almost have to go into another era that used better language. We have been so conditioned to calling bribery soft money, um, um, lobbying, consulting, speaking fees, things like this that we almost don't see it as a betrayal of the public trust, that a public official would sell their office for personal gain, okay? And uh, so I, in the book, I tried to introduce and, and use the era of the muckraking era, uh, the early 1900s, and quoted some of those people like Lincoln Steffens and others to see what's going on now, to see that that's all this is. These companies, these MLM companies have poured millions and millions of dollars into the coffers of politicians. And that the politicians have said, you know, we take this money and do nothing about it. And if nothing bad happens, what a deal. Well, something bad may be now brewing in the terms of public outrage as people are becoming aware. So I have some, some, I wouldn't call it hope, uh, but some possible expectation that um, 
something real could come out of this, um, that only to the degree, and I, I really hope that this emerge. Yeah, we've got a lot of public education going on. You're doing a great job of it. So many other people are doing, uh, well, I shouldn't say so many, but uh, enough other people are reaching millions of people now. Um, and the, the Reddit subgroup, anti-MLM is reaching so many people. The media has changed its characterization of MLM to a very negative term um, that there is a good deal of public education occurring, but it always has to meet this, this official endorsement validation. Okay, Alanda, recovering hum, Hunbot says it's a fraud, it's a scam, they're lying. But how could that be? I mean, they had this huge rally. The mayor of the city was there talking. Uh, they're giving money to charity. Uh, it must be good. It must be good. Right? So public education in the face of government support for scams can only go so far. I mean, it, I'm sure it's helped a lot of people. I, I know it has. I meet, I meet people all the time now. Tell me, I saw, uh, uh, you know, I saw a video channel. I, I read your book. I saw something in the news, and and I got out of it, or I chose not to get in it. So I know it's happening, but, and I think our hope, my hope, is that we had this nice conference. That was a breakthrough, but what I really hope is that the base of the anti MLM community, because it's becoming kind of a community, can become more unified to exert a single, several voices at least, to the government, so that they can't just take the money and get no negative consequences, that they will be forced to acknowledge it, look at it, Right now, as far as I know, there's not a single member of Congress who has spoken up against, I won't even say against, who's spoken up about multi-level marketing. Take a look. We have 44 congressmen who are part pushing them, part of their so-called direct selling caucus. Used to be called the Amway caucus. Yeah, Amway had its own caucus in, in Congress. So now it's called the Direct Caucus. And um, so, you know, that's the state of affairs. But I think it's changing, it's shifting. And um, hopefully it will galvanize into a, a voice that can exert some political influence. So um, I, I do think if, if I were a politician, if I were a regulator, I would have to say the good old days of taking all this fake money, this phony, ill-gotten money as so-called contributions and calling this an industry and calling it direct selling and entrepreneurship and pretending it's helping people may be ending. And you're going to have to actually go out and deal with reality of this mass scam occurring right under our noses, reaching into homes and businesses and churches and social networks and encouraging people to lie to their family and friends and, and see this as a form of political, social and economic corruption that's occurred in America. Well, Robert, I want to thank you so very much for your time. Um, please let my audience know what is the name of your book and where can they get it? Okay, so the book is Ponzi Nomics, the Untold Story of Multi-Level Marketing. And Ponzi Nomics, meaning Ponzi Scheme, Nomics, Economics. And it's about what is multi-level. The untold story is what it is. That's what the untold story of multi-level marketing is about what it actually is. So it goes through the history, politics, the propaganda, the cultism, you know, the whole thing. I wrote it because I felt people 
uh, this story had not been told in one place and one time authoritatively. And, and I've had plenty of years of opportunity to look at this consistently. I could not get a publisher that be willing to tell that whole story. It is published on amazon.com, fully accessible almost anywhere in the world as an ebook, Kindle, or whatever format you use, or as paperback. And it's a beautiful paperback, has a, a very easily read, very well made, with a, a beautiful cover uh, taken from the 14th century. And, um, and, uh, and it's selling. People, I, I'm getting wonderful feedback. Uh, people are buying the book, and I'm, I'm hearing from people, and it's gotten uh, almost 100% ratings on Amazon now. So I'm happy that uh, I managed to get the book out and uh, it took a long time to write it, but, uh, and I'm, I'm hopeful that it, the, it will contribute to this larger story that you're doing and others are doing. Um, I think of the book as a lot of people see pieces of MLM like this, what we're talking about today, uh, the, the um, dishonestly positioning people, you know, the scheme, breaking the rules and so on. Uh, product falsehoods and things like that. Everybody has pieces of MLM. This is the one place where you can get the whole story in one place in a very, I think, a very readable format. Everybody that's read it tells me it was an easy read, interesting read, um, connects a lot of dots. It's about America. It's a sociology book. <laughs> it's a history book. And um, and, and everybody that's read it tells me they, they learned, they learned and, and learned a lot. So that's my hope. And if that's, if that's happening, I, mean, I, I feel the, the book is, uh, you know, it's met its goal. That's fantastic. I have my copy. Um, I did want to ask, are you going to have an audio book come out? And if so, when? Yes, yes. So thank you for asking that. And, I, and the answer is yes. And I have been promising this for a while. Personally, I've been, as I, we talked about before we went on air here, I have been moving, which is a dramatic thing for my wife and I, because we had long-term household and we're moving out of that city, downsizing. So everything got delayed a few months, but I have a company I'm working with in Asheville, North Carolina. So where I now reside nearby there. So beginning that imminently, uh, and so hopefully before the summer is over, uh, we'll, that we'll have an audio version of Ponzinomics um, for people. And I have many people tell me, I, I don't have time to read books anymore. <laughs> I don't read books. I used to read books, but you know, um, but I'll listen to books. And, and so, I'm one of those, cause I yep. have it. And I like, by the time I get into bed to do something, it's like, I just don't have the mental capacity to do it, but- I got it, yeah, I understand you know, that. Too. As I told you, I'm moving. So my plan is when the audio book comes out to get it. And so when I walk the new neighborhood, I can listen to it and, you know, be able to soak it in. And then I'm probably going to ask you to come back so we can have more discussions about this, because to me, it's a, it's an ongoing, um, fascinating topic, as horrifying as it is. But I think it's, there are so many different layers to, you know, MLM that, I enjoy being able to discuss with you and leverage your expertise. And I thank you so very much for your willingness to share. Well, thank you for inviting me, Alana. Uh, I enjoyed the conversation too. And I think uh, there's, there's much more to say. And if you invite me back, I'll be happy to do that. And next time I'll have an audio book, I promise. It is always such a pleasure chatting with Robert. I think I find it so interesting is that there are people that when they begin to explore this notion of multi-level marketing, um, just can't stop digging into it. Robert's expertise on the subject reminds me I still have so much to uncover as I continue to peel back the many layers of this phenomenon. I was not surprised to learn that he has heard many stories over the years of how people are placed in positions to win. I think that is such a low blow to all the people who have ever believed that MLM was going to change their lives. It really is more of a prison than freedom, MLM. Multi-level marketing is really more of a prison than any kind of freedom as you continue working on your mindset 
so that you will have that time freedom and financial freedom that never come. Add to all of that these people and companies who constantly bombard you with visions of luxury cars, yachts, trips, clothes, and you start thinking that this is what I need. You don't. All of that is just another layer of deception related to multi-level marketing. There is a link to Robert's book, Ponzi-nomics, The Untold Story of Multi-Level Marketing in the description. I urge you to check it out. Thank you for spending time with me and remember you're beautiful and I love you.